This is episode 0033, Gary J. Glorious Golden Nuggets. Today we have Aina alive. She is from Canada. She is a project manager with 10 years experience working in project management. She has managed projects that are technical, in construction, telecom, retail, engineering projects. She is also a transformational leader and an agile coach. She helps projects that have a lot of fuzzy things going on, uh, gain clarity so that the project can be completed as the buyer wants the project to be. She has a master's degree in electrical engineering and an MBA in technology. She holds a lot of different certifications. She is speaking to us today from Canada. What province are you in? I'm in Ontario right now. Okay. You're in Ontario. Super. I was born in British Columbia. So you know, we, have, we, have, we have slight connections that way. One of the things about her is that she is a former member of Toastmasters International and was a member of the Kiev Club where I would attend on my visits to Kiev. So it's great to have people. The world gets small in the digital world. And here we are, we have you today. And I want to thank you for coming onto our podcast. Thank you very much, Gary, for introducing me. And I also spent five and a half years in British Columbia and just five months in Ontario. So, oh, so you know British Columbia better than you know Ontario, that's for certain. British Columbia truly is a beautiful place. I love it there. My goodness, let's get started here. What is the one thing you wish you had known before you got started in your entrepreneurial approach to life? Thanks, Gary. Beautiful question. And it's actually very hard to answer since I wish I knew many things. But when I started, I basically knew nothing. I just wanted to start my business and see how it goes. But if I need to narrow down just to one thing, probably don't try to make it safe. As many people advised me, just start small and then do everything yourself and you can save money. And then if you want to scale, do it later. First, try it on this way. I wish I knew what I'm saying right now, a couple of years ago, what I want to do in future. If I want to scale, I would rather start scaling right away. Because if you start small and then you figure out you want to scale, it's very hard to pivot compared if you start building this business model right away. I think in the digital world, people can experiment and fail fast. If you experiment and you are succeeding, getting scaled quickly is the only answer that you have. And that's what makes you far more successful. So I think that's a really good point for people to understand. Don't play the game small. Dream big, think big, act big. It's absolutely right. So in, in this world, it's, it's crazy, this digital world, because things seem to happen so much faster and you can do it for less money for the most part than if you first had to build a brick and mortar place or purchase one. So when you think about all the things that could have possibly gone wrong in, in your career as an online entrepreneur, I don't like the word failures, but there's things that just don't go the way you want them to go. What was the biggest one and what did you learn from that? Yeah, I agree, Gary. It's uh, so fast nowadays and it's uh, so difficult to react to changes. But probably my failure is old like our world. Don't trust wrong people and don't trust in wrong people. That was probably my biggest failure is trusting with people you never know. But another problem I had is trust in wrong people and mixing the business relationships and uh, emotional relationships. And that caused the biggest failure and the biggest, you know, emotional burn down in my business journey. So no matter how fast we are, no matter what kind of changes we deal, the problems are still the same from what I heard like 20 years ago and even like earlier reading like classic books. Personal, never mix personal relationships and business relationships and never be so much impressed by how a person look and what's more how a person just look at his or her action and also look at his or her way of life before you met and it also says a lot. So you would probably save so much time just asking the person about his previous experience or her like previous life rather than starting these relationships and then figure out on your way in such a painful way. 
I think that's good advice for anybody. I had a, a woman the other day actually say to the effect, when you find people who tell you how good they are, how honest they are, how wonderful they are, how productive they are, how charitable they are, she says, the one thing they've left out is, I'm a con man. Because people who are good, wonderful, charitable, productive, don't tell you about that. You can just see it. Exactly. But and, not in a hard way. Yeah. And I think that's what happens in the digital world is people become very aware that the guy with the gold chains around his neck and the big watch and the flash car and the house behind them, beware. The guy that is really successful usually doesn't have any of that flash stuff. And they're just sharing with you real experience. And that's what I have found. In fact, even more than that, and this goes to another question that we have about resources. I find that people out there who are really successful, if you are sincere, if you are congruent and you ask them for help, they can see that. They read energy. That's what they're doing, really. They're just kind of reading your energy, your sincerity. And based upon that, they will give you time and sometimes a lot of time to answer your questions and help you to become as successful as they are. That's my experience. I'm just wondering if that's true for you. It's very much true for me, Gary. So while you spoke, I probably like noted it's crazy, like every single word you said, because it exactly reflected my experience. All right. It has been about two bucketfuls of gold nuggets so far into this show. And uh, honestly, I tell you the truth. This woman knows what she's talking about. She is speaking from the heart and with sincerity. And I really hope you're listening to her messages. Now, what advice would you give somebody who's brand new, who's sitting on the fence and thinking about jumping into this digital world of entrepreneurship? What advice would you give to somebody like that who says, okay, I'm listening to you. I think I want to do it. What would be the first thing you would advise them? If you are brand new into business in general and online business, I see like uh, there are probably a couple of options for you how to start. First, you might have like many ideas and you don't know which one to pick. And the other thing, like you might already hear it from many other mentors, start narrow. So how can you choose how you can start narrow if you don't know which idea is better than another since you never tried yet? I would agree with both options. You need to start narrow, otherwise it's going to be like a Tetris game and you will fail since you don't have much experience. But how to narrow your business down? Exploration is also a phase of the business journey. So if you don't know yet, just Call it as it is, I am exploring, list down all of the options you have. I will give you a personal example. So when I started like teaching business, I could be like a personal coach. I wanted to do like certification coach. Even if you narrow down to the certification coaching, it's still too broad. So I could teach a professional project management certificate. I could teach a gel certificate. I could teach scrum certificate. I had like licenses, I had experience, I had uh, the material, but it's still too broad for myself since I started my business being alone. So even if I narrowed down to certification, I had three options. So I needed to narrow down to one. How to narrow down? And you could hear from many who actually like never had businesses, but if you start doing all of this, you're skilled, you're experienced, so you can cover broader audience. It means you can have like more money because you never know. And if you start, what if you fail and you will spend your money and you will never be successful. Don't listen to that. Just experiment, start small, start like, for example, the first month is a PMP certification, see how it goes. The second month start with agile. Don't advertise broad. You need maybe just one, two or three people to try it on. Then you figure out where your passion is, which is the most important for the small entrepreneurs like us, having a passion. If we don't have passion, we will burn out so quickly. And then during your exploration journey, when you feel like here, what I'm going to do, plan this narrow business from end to end. Don't jump into other fields. If you already chose, Start making your first money, start uh, being brand and being known by the first thing you're doing. And when you feel, yeah, now I feel safe. Now I'm making money. I know what I'm doing. Start adding more and more items to your business if you want to, and just do it one by one.
I have a phrase for those people that kind of think about maybe I should jump here or I should jump there. And that is beware of the shiny objects. Just beware of them. If you have a good thing, stick with it. If you have passion about it, stick with it. The grass always looks greener across the road in the beginning, but eventually you'll find that the grass is just as green right under your own feet. That's where I would go on this. So, you know, if yeah. you could identify some resources that you like to fall back to, or if you could say, you know, they, these were some really pivotal things, what resources would you say I really relied on in the beginning? Wonderful question, Gary. And so difficult to answer since it's so hard to find like reliable resources. And also it depends uh, on what type of personality you are. I am like passionate, speedy personality. And it's on the other hand, I have a disadvantage. It's hard for me to do the research and to like rely on some researches. So to cover this disadvantage, kind of always tried to pair in with people who are the opposite of mine. So my best resources were always people. Like first people who've done similar paths to mine, not identical because who would like to grow the competitor, but someone who is similar, but not exactly in your field. So people actually like helping each other and like giving advice, especially if they see the potential in you. But even if you don't have a mentor, but you grow in your network, probably there is someone in your network who has like the opposite set of skills or the opposite mindset. And for some people, they even like, like doing research and like finding like online sources. So you can like ask them, or if you are not in such a good relationship, even like pay these people for that time. And they would like taking this challenge and find the best resources for me. So being short, people are my best resources. Absolutely. I, I think finding a good mentor, somebody who's already successful, you're not doing exactly what they're doing, but they have the wisdom and the skills. That's one. And for me, the other thing was I found accountability groups, people who were also doing their business, who would hold me accountable from meeting to meeting on what I said I would do between now and then. That was really immaterial for me. And I think that's true for everybody. Now we talked about those resources, but let me ask you this. Were there any books, any specific people, any specific groups that you might have belonged to that you relied on as a source to move you along in this digital world? There is definitely Simon Fraser University Society where I was taking an MBA in British Columbia. So that was a great resource and some professors, even like without knowing that they were helping me, they gave like beautiful advice during their lectures, which I was taking specifically one professor, Andrew Harris and his entrepreneurial course. So he gave a fantastic advice, like test your idea before you start actually building it. And due to that idea, I would never imagine that my journey actually started from this idea. When I started testing it, I met a mayor of New Westminster in Vancouver, but like you always like start small and then you never know who this idea or who this journey will co contact you with. From the book's perspective, I really like Adam Grant as an author. His books always inspired me, especially his book Originals. I read it just before I started my digital journey. There is like no much about like business, like in digital world, but the examples are like so inspiring and there are like so many like basic things when you read it, but actually it's not like my universe collapsed after what I read. But you didn't pay attention before that. And while I was reading, and I also like, like making notes while I'm reading the book, after Adam Grant's originals, I made probably 10 or more pages, just <laughs> noting his, in quoting. I'm really glad that you've had such inspiring pieces that you can flow with. And I think anybody can transfer that into what they're doing here or where they can go. Because I think sometimes the worst places to learn how to do business is a business school. Because a lot of the professors have never had a business. They just got a lot of theory. 
But when you can find somebody who actually can give you good information, it's worth taking that class. It's worth it when you find out who is of value there. The whole program may not be of value, but a specific class can. And in my own personal life, one of my professors when I went to uh, Arizona State University was Robert Caldini, the man who wrote the book Influencing. Now, he taught a class that only cost me about $600 at the time to take, but his $600 class has been worth about $6 million to me just on the information he gave in that class. I think it's right. Go find people who will inspire you, find people who will give you information, but you gotta drive. You are the entrepreneur, you're totally responsible and you have to keep educating yourself. So I really loved your answer, thank you so much. I, I already told her she's more than a pretty face. She's a really bright gal. She knows exactly what she wants to do and where she's going. I'm embarrassing her. I'm the host, I'm allowed to embarrass my guests from time to time. So, I, you know, what would be the most common myth you would like to bust about being an online entrepreneur? You already busted it, Gary. I'm not just a pretty face. <laughs> That's what most people are thinking about me. Like they look at me or a young, pretty female. Everything she's done was easy because I keep saying like find the mentors and I had like so many wonderful people in my way and most of them were men, but I don't think that was a cause just because the female entrepreneurship, it, it wasn't like very common, like in last 20, 30 years. So it's just like way more common to find a man in like his fifties or sixties who had this experience rather than meet a woman. And like being just a pretty face for me, it was even like negative scene rather than positive. And people assume, or if you are uh, good looking, you are probably like stupid or they even like want to use you in their own girls. But the way I found mentors and the way I built everything, it, it wasn't easy at all. It was hard. And like some people also think, oh, you're like talented. And since I speak like English and a bit of French and Italian, or you are talented like two languages, you're like smart. That's why it's so easy for you. No, I had to wake up like at 5 a.m. where my brain was fresh and like studied for three hours, like memorizing English, French and Italian words. And my memory is too short. It was tough. And when this like male mentors, when they agreed to mentor me, they heard my story and what's more, they saw like how much I struggle and how much I want to build what I built. They saw the core and that's why people start helping you. Like not just because you're pretty or not. One of the things that I think is really interesting is in my beginning days of my entrepreneurial journey, my first two or three accountability groups were predominantly women in the group and one of the things that they suggested to me was I needed to join the 5 a.m. club. And I asked them, what was that? And they said, you get up every day at 5 a.m. and you start your work day at 5 a.m. Now, I have joined the 4 a.m. work club because I found 5 a.m. wasn't early enough. My brain is all switched on at 4 a.m. I can get things done. And in the time frame from 4 a.m. to about 10 a.m., I can get as much done as I used to get done between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. So it's been a real productive jump. That's one thing that I would say to people. You have the time. When are you going to use it? And does that mean you actually have to get up earlier when mentally you're more aware and more capable? Or are you going to just go late into the night and then oversleep in the morning and say, I just don't have time? I had another lady from Canada this last week speaking by the name of Tracy Lamore. She's a PR person. And she said, in the last two weeks, I've seen 10 minutes of Netflix. How much time can you say you watch Netflix this week? She says, you got to be busy. You got to be doing what you're passionate about. You can't be just sitting down watching Netflix. And that's, that's the truth. That's the truth. And people have to sit there and say, that's the life of an entrepreneur. You are going to be more busy and more productive than you've ever been working for somebody else. And number two, you're going to have so much passion for the project you're working on, you don't feel like you're working. It's the truth. It's the truth. You know, you're, you're really very much a lot of fun, Elena. And, you know, if you could step into my shoes for a moment, let's say that you have a question in your mind that you know I should be asking you because you have an answer you want to give the world. So let me ask you this. 
what would be that question and what's the answer you have for us? So I was talking about mentorship that I had many mentors in my life, but now I want to give it back to the society. So I mentor myself a, a lot and many people tell me, but you know what you are doing and I have an imposter syndrome or have you ever had an imposter syndrome in your life? And we can't do it because of the syndrome and you're just lucky that you don't have it. No, at first I never knew what I was doing when I was doing it first time in my life. And yes, I fell to the imposter syndrome, but what's more like what the imposter syndrome is. It's like actually when you know what you are doing, but you still believe that you are not good enough and you feel like an imposter, but I was a real imposter. Like I pivoted to my career five times until I realized what I want to do. And every time I had to exaggerate my experience just to be given the chance as in America, we say like fake it till you make it. So first you kind of exaggerate your abilities to get this first chance and then you need to prove it. So every time I prove it, but before that I felt like an imposter and because I was an imposter. It's really difficult feeling, but how to overcome it? Just like do your best and you have like some previous experience, which probably you think is irrelevant. For example, when I pivoted from engineering to IT world, I had zero experience in IT. So I felt like really bad when I didn't understand the IT language. But what I had from my past is a soft skills. Since I already worked with teams, I already worked with stakeholders. So I could like brought that experience to this field and start building a trust and new experience already like on something I knew what I'm doing and work hard as crazy to overcome my disadvantages. I think everybody have the imposter syndromes, but it depends on you and on your choice. If you just like keep sitting and saying, I can't do it because I'm an imposter or just like trying to shut up your inner voice and keep doing and like preparing a plan. So why I'm feeling as imposter, what else I need to learn and work as crazy as you can to learn it. I think it's really interesting because imposter syndrome is everywhere in the digital universe. I have yet to meet somebody who's just starting out, who has the confidence to say, I'm not an imposter. I have so much unique experience in the world that I can bring it to the digital universe because there's a niche waiting for me. Everybody else is kind of sitting there going, I don't know. Am I good enough? Had bad reviews at work before, <laughs> this kind of thing. Forget it. When you come into the digital world, there is nobody as unique as you. And I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for that answer to that question. That is really great. So Aina, how could people, now, wait a minute, everybody, I'm going to take the information she's about to give you and put it in the show notes. So don't stop your car. Don't be writing down just go to the show notes afterwards. But Aina, how is the best way for people to get in touch with you? So I am in a couple of social medias. So the best way, if you have a LinkedIn, connect with me there. I'm quite often in that social media. Also, uh, since February, I'm in Clubhouse and I am doing some podcasts there as well and some Q and A's. So if you are in Clubhouse, you can find me there as well. And I didn't use Instagram much, but uh, since uh, Clubhouse is mostly like Instagram and uh, Twitter related apps, so people keep asking me why you are not on Instagram. So I kind of recovered my Instagram profile. So like next month, uh, I'm planning to become more active there. So if you don't have LinkedIn and like Clubhouse, but have Instagram, Feel, please feel free to connect with me there. Just one more thing I'd like to add. She's given me a link to a library of articles that she has written. So anybody who wants to check out a professional individual here, there will be articles that you can also jump in onto and take a look at. I, I appreciate anybody who can write. I think the magic of writing is you write things that you didn't know that you knew. <laughs> and it proves to you, you know, a lot more than what you thought you knew in that process. So that's wonderful. Now, I, you know, one of the things that I do is I offer every person who comes on this show two minutes to say anything that's on their heart. I don't interrupt you at all. And your two minutes start now. 
Thank you, Gary. Just want to comment your previous comment about writing. So sometimes I read my articles from two or three years ago and think, oh God, I was smart three years ago. What happened to me right now? Why I didn't follow my own advice? Back to your uh, question, since uh, the podcast name is Gary Golden Nuggets, probably I supposed to give you some nuggets by the end. And what I would say, like, take your journey as a journey, not as a business trip. Because in a business trip, we have a deadline, we know what we want to do, what outcomes we want to get at the end. We plan everything like specifically what kind of plane we take, what kind of hotel we're going to leave, uh, what organization we're going to visit, uh, who we want to negotiate with, and then how we fly it back home. Your business trip is a journey. And I know sometimes I feel bad when I read in social media, like so many people are like young entrepreneurs. And unfortunately, I miss this deadline, still hoping being like 40 under 40, but <laughs> who knows. But even if we like miss all of the deadlines, we have a journey, not like a trip with a deadline. Because if we are just like too focused and too narrow on the end of the outcome, we could like miss so many things. Uh, for example, if we are talking about actual journey, we can stop to smell the rose and to miss the train, but that's the part of the journey. Then we take another train or a taxi to catch the train and meet a wonderful person and have wonderful stories. At the end, we would never have if we plan everything thoroughly. And my favorite movie is Interstage 60. It's quite old, but that is exactly about the journey and about who we meet at the journey. And at the end, what we have, a result or like many, many stories to tell to your friends or maybe your, ch your children and grandchildren. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Aina alive. And boy, is she alive, and did she give us golden nuggets today. They're just all over the floor. If you didn't pick them up the first time, play the podcast again. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. Please forward it on to somebody you know that will enjoy this kind of information. This is such a value-laden podcast. Thank you. I thank you so much for being on this podcast. Thank you very much, Gary, for having me. It was a pleasure for me. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll catch you on the next podcast.